I mean, it will fit again. How are we? Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey, Diane is not Diana in is the up. frame yet. That's there we go. Okay, so here we go. Yeah. There we go. Yes. So, are we live? Can we see, check over there? Is that coming through? <laughs> the delays of new media. <laughs> <laughs> Are we all right? We're all right. Great. Okay, so um, hello everyone and welcome to this unrehearsed, zero budget, low tech, mostly unscripted netcast live from Franklin Furness headquarters in New York. I'm Ellie Clark and uh, I'm an artist and researcher doing a practice based PhD um, at Goldsmiths in London. And I've been here for the past few weeks digging through these boxes, looking through CD-ROMs and um, various Flash websites, looking at, in particular, the future of the present series, which was a series of performances that Franklin Furness supported between 1998 and 2008 for work designed to be shown online. In 1998-9, I was an intern here and have occasionally, in the past few weeks, encountered or bumped into myself in some of the documentation <laughs> of the post-show performances or in the netcasts that we had and the live discussions that took place afterwards. My time here in the 90s and being witness to these very early netcasts bumpy in their, tr bumpy in their transmission, buffering in their speed, actually had a massive impact on the way I think about the internet today and the work I continue to make. So, with me here at Franklin Furness, in person, is founder Martha Wilson, who founded Franklin Hello. Furness from her loft department in Tribeca. And we have fund-winning artists from the Future of the Present series, Irina Danilova, <laughs> Ray C. Wright, and Diane Luden. And then joining us from Zoom, from various corners of the world, we have Tony Sant, over there, he's coming from, zooming in from Salford. And we have Lynn Casabon, yeah, who's in Baltimore. You missed somebody in the introduction. <laughs> oh, and Joshua, I'm sorry, yes, that's good. Okay. And Joshua Pope. I get that all the time. <laughs> 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 he's doing <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, and my PhD project is called Is My Body Out of Date? The Drag of Physicality in the Digital Age. And I'm looking at the relationship between the physical body and the digital body. And the physical body being the body that we inhabit, that we have to be in in order to survive, the flesh and blood body we're still dependent upon to exist. And then the digital body is the data that is out there about us, that we generate and is, is generated about us. And then the moments at which these bodies, the digital body and the physical body, collude, collide, compete, and collaborate in the performance and setup of identity. In the context of a world that is increasingly digitally mediated and tracked, where the definitions between physical and digital are difficult to ascertain, including whether an agent you're talking to is a bot or not, the Future of the Present series offers me a case study and a means of trying to track the developments of the net in the early years and the navigation of it as a medium. Franklin Furness was one of the very, very first venues to offer up the internet as a platform for, for performance. So a great deal of, of the work in the early stages was at least about trying to figure out how to do it. And a lot of the files I've been looking in has been all about the various platforms which existed and probably no longer exist anymore. Well, I know they don't. Um, some of the performances were streamed live. So some of the performances took place in various studios and were live streamed at the time they were happening and others were made earlier and edited and broadcast at a later set date, sometimes with live discussions afterwards. Some of the video documentation, such as the series from 2000, are as yet totally unfindable because the server they were housed on and so-called archived on no longer exists. The netcast will last about an hour <coughs> and with regular breaks, so if you're watching on Facebook, please do share questions or comments and we're going to have a regular break and we'll actually try and get to your questions. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Martha. Hi. Come forward. Oh, come forward. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I want to start the discussion with the culture wars. Some of us are not old enough to remember the culture wars. Um, <clears throat> the culture wars cranked up for Franklin Furnace in 1984 when we invited nine women artists and activists to select uh, video, books, performance art, inst installation work that um, asked the question whether uh, pornography could be a feminist practice. Um, a member of the right wing religious right picked up a brochure off our front desk and wrote postcards to all of our funders and claimed that we were showing pornography to 500 children per day. Mm. This was 1984. This was also when Annie Sprinkle uh, decided to step over the line and instead of be a porn star, become a performance artist. So I'm very proud of that fact. But in the wake of the culture wars, and subsequently was um, Karen, Karen Finley was considered an obscene artist and uh, the NEA4 um, mounted a lawsuit to get their their fellowships back because their fellowships had been denied because of the content of their uh, work. It was Karen Finley, John Fleck, Holly Hughes, and Tim Miller, the NEA4. Anyway, at the end of the culture wars, uh, by the end of the culture wars, the internet had been invented and become popularized and was being used by regular people. And um, we decided as an organization that the next free zone was going to be the internet and that we were going to go virtual. We went virtual in 1996, uh, September of 1996. Our website became our public face and um, we sold the loft we had been living in for 20 years and we no longer had a performance space. So we started to look, I started to look for online performance art venues. What, what could we do to present our performance artists uh, worldwide online? Now, at the, at the time, the, the, inter, the image that was being produced by uh, organizations such as Sudo, Sudo is one of several companies that were trying to put television on the internet. I mean, that, that was what their goal was. The image was two inches by two inches, and it was really chunky. It's kind of, you know, the image was, it looked like the Im image was being shot on the moon. And so Irena Danilova <laughs> <laughs> exploited the properties of the internet at that time by doing a performance with an American astronaut, yeah, a, a, Brit a Russian cosmonaut and an American astronaut landed on the moon and had a discussion. And do you want to... Shall I, shall I let Irena talk about this? Well, we're going to bit? speak about that. I mean, we can okay. share that, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, the punchline is that the properties of the internet, although primitive, were exploding the real time and space that perfor the performance art community had become used to using uh, because now we could take an image and put it on a server and get it in six months. So, so time was gone and space also was gone because it was being broadcast all over the world. Yeah. That's my intro. That's great. <coughs> hey, why is that doing that? I think that's gone funny because I'm sharing that. <laughs> Great, and um, thanks Martha. So Tony, would you like to um, say a bit about your research? Hi Tony. Hello everyone, hello Martha. <laughs> uh, it's lovely to see you all again after all these years. Uh, perhaps it's longer for the rest of us except for Martha, but it has been <laughs> two years even with Martha. Um, I won't take very long to say much really, except to say that uh, my association with Franklin Furness really uh, comes in three phases. Uh, the main phase, of course, is the work I did in terms of my research for my, my PhD initially and what eventually became my book about Franklin Furness. But before that, the first phase uh, starts from about 1995, 96, 
which is when I moved to New York and I started my graduate studies at uh, NYU. And it was there that I first became aware of Franklin Furnace, really. Uh, the, we have to remember, aside from uh, the wonderful potted history that Martha just gave, mm -hmm. that uh, the Franklin Furnace performance space had been closed down some years before uh, this, so in the early 90s. Um, and so the Franklin Furnace performance program was an exile, uh, as, as Martha has described it several, time, several times. And so it, it wasn't so easy to come across uh, the performances presented by Franklin Furnace at this time. It was, it was relatively easy to go to the gallery space on Franklin Street, but that only lasted until 1996, mm. right? When, as Martha said, you know, the, 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 the Furnace sold at the loft on Franklin Street and went virtual. And so this is, if you will, you know, when I, when I really became interested that there was something really going on here about uh, the immateriality you know the, the, there's nothing there it's all virtual but it's there and it's all the same level of commitment and the same uh, level of engagement at least from the organization that it had had for the previous 20 years so the main phase then was uh, really started with um, um, Franklin Ferris deciding to consolidate its performance program into uh, these uh, things that were called live art on the internet at the time. So the future of the present was presented as a live art on the internet uh, program. And, and here uh, is where my worlds intersected, if you will. Because I was already doing some, some research on, on uh, Sudo and the work that Galinsky was doing on the performance channel, which was where the work by uh, Franklin Furness was being was being presented and so Galinsky said well you've got to do something with Martha I said yes of course let's go to Wales which is uh, where some of Martha's ancestors are from <laughs> so we, we brought it off to to Aberystwyth and this is where we we had a coven of sorts if you will and at the PSI conference is where we concocted what eventually became firstly uh, a set of classes that Martha and I started teaching at NYU I called going virtual. Uh, Martha and I taught this for two years at the NYU Performance Studies Department. And then I conducted a long, a series actually of interviews with Martha uh, for uh, Franklin Furness's 25th anniversary, uh, which coincided with 9-11 uh, in 2001, mm. uh, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, but eventually uh, uh, this was then first published in TDR and, and eventually this, this was the beginning, if you will of what, what uh, I started writing for, for my PhD. It's also important to note that uh, the, this work wasn't just concentrated you know, with just pseudo. Uh, there was a significant amount of this work that then went on in collaboration with Parsons. And Jean Guy, I think, is, is, is an important uh, character there as much uh, to mention as Galinsky was uh, for, for pseudo. But without taking too much time, for me, the, the, the final phase, which is a much shorter phase, although it's, it's longer in years, uh, is, is uh, what I like to call after Mouchette. Mm. So uh, um, uh, Martha uh, had a, a, a mentioned to me this really interesting artist that Franklin Furness had programmed called uh, Mouchette, or this really interesting piece that was put on at the Postman's Gallery uh, in, in 2003 and from this uh, Martha started writing something that I consider still a very important text which is uh, lessons uh, Franklin Furness learned from presenting the live art on the internet this was her editorial for um, um, a special uh, supplement or a special section uh, of Leonardo the, the magazine that's published by MIT Press and uh, and there I wrote about Mouchette, or I wrote an introduction to an interview about Mouchette, but, but I think this was what crystallized everything for me. It was also the year when I completed my PhD, uh, the year after I left New York uh, for the UK. Uh, but, but it was really at this time, I think, uh, that I really became interested in seeing how we, how we uh, make some sense of all this work that I had done with Franklin Furness uh, so that, you know, I could, I could kind of have something tangible rather than just my postgraduate studies. And with the support of Franklin Furness and with some very, very 
uh, gracious generosity as ever from Martha, uh, we did eventually come to the book in 2011. And uh, I think my, my, uh, my work really uh, stopped more or less there in relation to Franklin Furnace, although I've gone on to do um, several other things in relation to media archaeology and documenting performance and, and digital art and internet art. I think the last thing I really did was, was revisit or revise the, 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 the interview um, that, that Martha and I uh, had, had published in already two or three uh, previous editions into the Martha Wilson source book, yeah, which again is, I think, an essential text for anyone doing any research on Franklin Furnace. Don't forget, I always contended that Martha Wilson is Franklin Furnace. <laughs> Franklin Furnace is Martha Wilson. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I'm gonna just to give some images to the people who are watching. Um, I'm gonna just have this slideshow of some things that I have encountered in, um, you know, in my kind of travels through the internet, and that's hopefully just going to run, um, so that that can just we can see a few things there. So you kind of see some of the, um, obviously the design calendars. and the calendars <laughs> and that sort of thing, and the design of these of, of these kind of flyers and um, and a lot of although it was all online, there was still so much actual postcard sending out by post and that sort of thing. So. You forget, then there's me, where I found myself in the, in the <laughs> archive, um, and Martha in various outfits. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... So, t Tony's book, which I kind of read in the last, actually, month, because I actually found it here, and um, it's very... In I think it's very interesting how it talks about the, yeah, the kind of changes in, in the way that the, d the net develops, and also the way that the various artists are responding to that, and, and obviously the pitfalls as well. I wonder at this point then if we are going to, we should look at um, Joshua's work and your work was presented in 1999? Yes, that's right. So it was during the first series, so which first was in season. association with Pseudo Studios, which, and that's, um, just come in so you can see me as well. So um, Pseudo Studios was, that was the, when I arrived in 1998, that's where these netcasts were happening. Um, and it was quite an amusing experience going up to this, sixth floor loft um, and and uh, kind of a lot of rigmarole to make a video that was as Martha said oh. absolutely tiny and uh, very difficult to watch in a way and obviously you have to have dial up and that sort of thing um, yeah so yeah so I'm going to show you some of your work Joshua sorry are there people watching it would uh, be nice to say hi to them if they are Eight people. Hello, people watching. <laughs> so, upstage, upstage. Right. So I'm just looking at. Hang on, wait. Where are we here? So, so this is Joshua's work that was shown. So, uh, was this? Was, I had a question for you, which is: Was this was this live streamed, or was it recorded before and then streamed and then shown via pseudo? Oh, as far as I remember, it was done. Happened live. Done live. Ellie, um, can you share the screen? I can't see. Oh. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh oh. Sure. Uh, no, there's also a massive debate. Are people watching on Facebook? They are. Yes. Facebook can you see it now? Yes. Okay, great. Right, here we go. <laughs> so that's the end of one section. We go to the beginning of another, I think. Joshua, do you want to put the sound down a bit? Do you want to explain a little bit what, how this was made and what you're... Okay. 
Um, the piece is called Headset Sextet, and it uses a technique that I developed, but didn't entirely invent, actually, that I call headphone-driven performance. And performers wear headphones and try to vocalize along with pre-recorded voices that they've never heard before. And I mean vocalize right along, not repeat right after, which is what most people are sure that I mean. Mm -hmm. But I train my performers to really vocalize right along, which means they're horribly inaccurate. It's all mistakes. I, I rehearse them with practice material. Yeah. And the, 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 the main part of this training is to get them to sort of jump ahead and get right on top of the material and do it with utter conviction, which is not to say that they don't care, what the hell, it doesn't matter, because I'm pretending that it's correct. They're trying, but they're also believing, and they're absolutely simulcasting. Um, and the material that they're hearing is mostly just plain spoken language and some singing. But the result of their effort and their complete delusional belief that they're nailing it gives me the effect that I want. It's mostly gibberish. But for various reasons, well, actually for one main reason, because the material repeats, you get this process of gibberish morphing its way into real language at various different rates. Um, and so I did a suite with six performers and six movements, as it turned out, that I called Headset Sextet. And this was a performance piece made to be done live in front of people. And because of the surprise, the built-in surprise uh, that's necessary for this kind of performance to work, each performer could do one role only once. So it's very much an ephemeral thing. And as such, documentation is really, really important. I mean, it's mm -hmm. always important. But this is a built-in one-time thing, so you can't, do, you can't record the second night and have it be maybe better than the first night because it's going to have a different cast. Mm -hmm. And so even though when we did the net Apparently cast... Apparently it stopped streaming. That's what you just found out, right? <laughs> we stopped streaming. Yeah. I blew up the internet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder why that is. That through Facebook it stopped streaming. Yeah. Okay. We lost the live. We lost the live. That's okay. weird. Okay. What did you guys say to Zuckerberg? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We had stopped streaming apparently, so we've got to see, figure out what's going on. No one cursed. Was that because I closed? Oh, because I closed. The <gasps> oh. So when did it back? stop? When did it stop? Uh, it stopped halfway through. Uh, when I was speaking. Oh, no. It's still from Domi. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Joshua's not... No, right, we better... Um, it's ephemeral. We better go it's back ephemeral. then to you, Tony. Yeah. That's it? It's, yeah. it's a new like kind of ephemerality. It's like your work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's really yeah, hard to exactly say. Yeah. Hey, Joshua, that was true performance. Yeah, we have to do it again. They're calling to say, you're off the air. Okay, we're going to do another one. Live. Yes, dear. Hi, everybody. Hello, Barbara. I'm good. One moment. Hold on. Hold on. Franklin Fenner's archive. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's okay. It's not, my, it's not my best side. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> what is your best side? You know? I don't know which is my best side. I think you have a good head on. <laughs> okay. Share screen, right, we're going to start. So, Tony, would you mind saying a bit more, or should we go back, or maybe we bring you in after, we'll have Joshua, and then we'll I, yeah, have I mean, you more I, in dialogue, I, perhaps. I, I, I don't mind. I mean, I, the, the question I had, actually, was uh, that you were recording this aside from streaming. Yes, I am, yeah. So I am recording it, yeah. If yeah. that's the case, yeah, I'm if we're, we're yeah. not being streamed, we're still yeah. being yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to go live again. So it's not lost. happened even once or twice in the first couple of seasons. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and although 20 years have passed, I see. I yeah. see that. The, ah. Very interesting. <laughs> okay, I'm clicking live again. Two. One. There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. We seem to have a technical hitch. <laughs> and um, is it now streaming again? takes time, doesn't it? Yes. Yep, back okay. on. Okay. Okay, great. So we seem to, um, unfortunately, we left half of Tony Tony's um, talk there, but we'll go back to him. And um, we're going to then 
probably show your work again that we just did. We're going As to you do, like. We're going to we're document, do a reconstruction of right. what we just did for the for the benefit of the live stream. Um, <laughs> I'm so let me just find that. Premise. <laughs> You're just improvising. You can let it continue from there. So this was oh oh, oh no, but that's this the is one. Just a quick time. Okay. So this was um, this was a uh, work that Joshua Freed made in 1999, and it was live streamed. So we're just going to watch a bit of this now with the sound like this. <laughs> So Joshua, do you want to just explain a little bit about we'll have it still running? Okay, yeah. so we, we saw the end of one movement and the beginning of the next movement of my piece called Headset Sextet. And it is a suite for six headphone-driven performers. And headphone-driven performance is a technique that I developed, but I didn't actually invent, but I'd say I developed it, where performers try to vocalize along with pre-recorded voices over headphones that they've never heard before. And I mean vocalize right along. Most people think that I mean repeat right after, even after I say what I'm saying. But I really mean repeat right along. So, and I train my performers to do this. They're hearing very emotional, but regular spoken language and some singing. And the result of their attempt, and they really do try to be accurate and convey the emotion and not lag behind gives this crazy effect, which I want and like, and it's mostly gibberish, to be clear. And so each performer can do a given role only once. So every night is different. So it's, if it's technologically enhanced ephemerality. And as such, it really needs documentation. And the funny thing is, sitting here now, I barely watched this since the, the neck cast on pseudo. And back then, you know, it was a postage stamp. Okay, it was two by two inches by two inches on the screen and very uh, slow frame rate. And now this turns out to be one of the best documents I have of this work. And it's crazy that it, that it got here. But this work itself is not, was not intended specifically to be neck cast. I'm not prolific enough for that. This took years for me to create. So we just did it for the netcast. So I was trying to think, is there an angle by which this fits into the net art webby thing? And the one thing I could think of is it, it has this sort of built-in mediation because of the headphones. Um, but it's still really about one-time only human performance. So I'm just glad to get it out there and document it. I mean, the impression I had when looking at it, it's a bit like everybody being on the street in New York talking on their phones at the same time. <laughs> Which, of course, yeah. you know, not everyone had phones in those days, but mm. it's sort of like everybody's like having their own uh, kind of dialogue yeah. uh, alongside each other rather, rather than with each other. So I thought that was, yeah. that was kind of from seeing it from this, from this perspective, from that. Oh, I can see that. Back then, if you were talking out loud and no one was there on the streets of New York, you were branded uh, pathological. Yeah. But now... You can't no get yourself branded yeah. pathological. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there were cell phones back then, actually. Maybe not yet. Uh, if what, sorry? Cell phones. If we had the late cell 90s. Phones, so were, they were just there, yeah. Um, you had just one in your there. performance, actually. Oh. Yeah, you actually, you, yes, you get to, yeah, you have a little, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Great. In the live one, yeah. Thank you, Joshua. Sure. So, um, Ray, would you like, should we show, we'll show a bit from you now? Um, 
And here, this, because I think we, we cut off before, that here are just some images that I've taken of my kind of digging through the archives of um, lots of slides. Actually, the slides are very interesting. I'm just sort of making a little detour here because documentation, the first performances were incredibly well documented on slide film as if they were live performances. And of course, it's just lots of bodies sitting around a computer. And although it's different performances taking place, the kind of look of all of them is pretty similar because the way you sit in front of a computer is uh, different. It has less possibilities of difference than when you sit on a chair without a desk in front of you or whatever. So um, I found that quite interesting. And I think that stopped then about probably a year in. There, were, there were suddenly weren't any more slides. But actually, I'm very glad of those now. But it's, um, it's a lot of documentation of very old machines, <laughs> which is good. So we're now going to show... Ray. So we just we just took minute clips from um, much longer work. It's infrared, you can hear it. Halfway between a mugging and a seduction, this struggle, the metal against my thighs, something under my short skirt, either a hand or a break. I think of the expression shocks and struts. These are car parts, but I'm, I'm not sorry. sure what they do. I think shocks are what keep you from bouncing too hard in motion, but struts make me think of peacocks mm -hmm. and of men. And there's the expression, parking. They went parking. So old, that expression. So stupid, so innocent. I've got these things in my mind, sitting on the floor of my mind like rotten metal under a riverbed. The car is warm. Day ended so long ago, but the metal is warm, not with use, but with sun. It's high summer midnight. Someone has parked this car, and we're up against it, struggling, a biblical struggle. We look from... So I don't know if you want me to show you another little clip from another part of it, because it's all sure. very different, isn't it? So yeah. I think that would be quite good um, to show maybe from... I think this um, is... Good. When she finished it, she spoke to it. She said, you are very beautiful. You Denise, are beautiful yeah. because I am yeah. beautiful and because I made you and because of the colors of you. Sorry? Do you have a mother? What's you're as beautiful as... Sorry, are you trying... Sorry, is that Tony? Yeah. yeah. I would say, like the rest of us to see it, perhaps you could share your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it got unshared. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you see it? As a ball. You are as beautiful as light. You are as beautiful as a ribbon. You are as beautiful as a loving mother. You are as beautiful as a kid. You are as beautiful as love. You are as beautiful as... What do I see here? Purses. What's purses? You are as beautiful as a blankie. You are as beautiful as a card. You are as beautiful as a pillow. As a blankie and a pillow. Mm -hmm. As a clap. Yeah, and then I wanted to just go to the bit where you also took, stole <laughs> this bit of a uh, previous performance by Franklin Furness as well, just because that was, and that had just happened Alana. the year before. Yeah, Alana Hilberts. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was Pseudo Studio Walk, and that was actually the very first, the very first live live cast yeah. that happened. Yes. So, I mean, if you want, we can turn the volume down on this, and then um, you can speak a little bit over yeah, it as it plays. Yeah, that'd be great. If I can work out how to do that. No, I think we'll have to stop it. It's not on quick time. But yeah, if you'd like to just say a bit about, about making that work and also kind of, I suppose, also what's interesting is one of the questions. So I sent a survey to lots of people, all the artists who received a grant over these 10 years, I sent a survey out to. And this is how come this has happened, actually, because I just had a question at the end saying, if we have a netcast, would you be happy to take part? And, and this was actually organised really in short notice, sort of a week ago or something. Um, yeah, so, and, and one of the questions that I was asking in that was, why, um, what, what was it for you to get this grant? And, and so I think that's also a really interesting thing. You think about the other grants that are out there, and then there's this grant that asks you to make work on the internet, which you might not even, a lot of people didn't even have at home at that point, so how do you do that? So, yeah, Ray, I, want, I wonder if you can sort of respond to that around your work a little bit. Well, I actually got another grant, which I used this work, 
um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so that was interesting. But I, I'm struck looking at all these things that I chose from all the work that had already been done. They chose them because they appealed to me. And then I had some other artists whose work I liked. And then I had some children, like the one you just had. I just copped those children. And uh, I was reading a poem in the beginning of Deb Margolins, and she uses a lot of her children's words and thoughts. So there's appropriation on appropriation on appropriation. But what for me was common to all these things is they were somehow peaceful. Mm. And that really strikes me because I am not. <laughs> I mean, I'm a very, I mean, I'm trying to be, especially at this hour of my life, but I, I'm historically hysterical and combative and, uh, you know, uh, fighter. And yet in this medium, I was really drawn to things that had some, some quiet and spaciousness and peacefulness and looking at the piece again I'm like oh I'm just talking too much like I don't want to hear the talking I want to just look that's all I wanted was just on this medium mm. to just but did it do you look. think it made a difference for you I mean was was that very much I'm just interested in how different it might have been had it been a, TV, a local TV broadcast or if the internet the fact I'm interested in what made the that this is the kind of output um, kind of interesting, like what aspect of the internet kind of influenced or was cons did you consider in the making of this? Well, it's, what was appealing is the visuals mm. that were, yeah. like, so on a television show there's a narrative, it's a story. Um, this is a kind of dance, yeah. which I was saying before is something that's participatory generally, but I loved watching her move, and I loved how Glinsky colored her. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got you go through goldfish and and sky. All of yeah. these are very peaceful. Yeah. So that was Galinsky that did this. Then she that he he made this the pictures different. Yeah, yeah. he put the color in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that had only just happened about six months before, right? Yeah. So, and did you speak to Halona about that, or did you just do it? Um, we had her permission. Yeah. To okay. Do it, so. Yeah, and of course the whole issue of appropriation is just has never gone away with the internet, has grown with the internet, hasn't it? So that's been a huge thing. Great. Take and take and take. Yeah. <laughs> but to what end are we using it? Mm -hmm. You know, and I guess that's what's kind of critical. Yeah. I was really struck because you were talking about the body, that when Martha was speaking, she's sitting right next to me. Yeah. And when she first sat down and, you know, and I said hello, I said, oh, you smell good. <laughs> you yeah. know, like you can't get that from the internet. No. But <laughs> I noticed <laughs> that I was looking at Martha sometimes when she was speaking, and then other times, of course, I was looking at her image, mm -hmm, yeah. so I could see her <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. Um, well, as we've established, Zoom has this <laughs> touch up my appearance um, wow. special <laughs> setting that just selects itself, where it airbrushes all your wrinkles out, so <laughs> I'm actually 10 years older wow. than I look. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So thank you for that. I think we'll move on. Lynn, are you happy to? I'm going to show a little bit of your um, of your work here. This is again in just a minute, and okay. uh, and this work you made in remind me was it 2004? Uh, that's when I, I started. I started the project in 2003. Actually, it was um, the website pr probably was online by 2005, 2006. It was also an installation, a uh, physical installation. Do you want me to say a bit about it before you show the clip? Or no, let's show the clip it? first, and then yeah. <laughs> It's just something about this. It's just, I don't know what it is, but if it's a guy, you know, uh, what's he calling me for? I'll be home calling him on the house line. If you like the, that you're being called. Yeah. That you're being, yeah. somebody yeah. needs to get a hold of you. Exactly. It's that important that he had to call me. Mm -hmm. He's priced. I don't want to pick up the phone. I just like, I just like being able to do that. I don't know what it is. I'm sick. I don't know. I don't know. I love that so far. I just, I love it so much. Me le fait que je celui-ci, c'est l'ordinateur portable. So it's in French, but I think we can get it. Il y a un téléphone, il y a les images, les films, le son que je vais écouter, les logiciels que j'utilise, et euh, en... ce petit objet détient tout. 
toute une partie de ma vie. C'est surtout les numéros de téléphone. De, de mes amis, des gens. Euh, aussi de... Over to you. <laughs> okay, so the project started, um, I had a fellowship, the Camargo Foundation in Marseille, France, near, near Marseille, France, and I um, came up with this crazy idea, uh, not being a fluent French speaker, to go around the city of Marseille and meet people and interview them about their connection to a technological device of their choosing yeah. that they felt an affinity with. So um, it, that's how it started. And then when I got back to Baltimore, I did another set of interviews um, of people in Baltimore with the same questions. And so you're seeing those two, two people there. Uh, the first one um, was in Baltimore, and she's talking about her flip phone, her cell phone. Um, um, and then uh, 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 the second person is in, in Marseille talking about his laptop computer. That was in, you know, in 2003. Her interview was done in 2004. Um, so it's the project. Although the project ex existed as a website, that's how um, with how the Franklin Furnace grant uh, played into it. Um, that was its its uh, main home, um, but it really became an archive of technology. <laughs> very quick, you know, not very quickly, but it, it has become an archive because there actually wasn't like iP iPods at that point. Um, mm. you know, so the collection of technologies that people chose are an interesting eclectic um, collection. And which were the other technologies that people talked about? Oh, it ranges from, um, there's, some, there's other computers, there's television sets, there's camera, there's a vacuum cleaner, there's a, um, mm. a, a highlighter pen. I, 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 I cast a very broad net in terms of how I define technology. Um, and actually the French people were a little bit more um, philosophical about it in terms of their, you know, how they selected it. One woman who was in her 80s selected a book Mm. Or books, and so we talked a lot about that. How that's a technology in in Baltimore. There was a woman from uh, Mexico who did her in interview in, in Spanish, and she chose a mocha hete, which is like a mortar and pestle where she made salsa. <laughs> um, so, and can you thing. can you just tell tell us a little bit about how that was how you showed that then, and the kind of role of the internet within that, and how that responded to the future of the present um, mm -hmm. kind of outline? Yeah. So the pr the project. Unfortunately, the, the website is no is no longer. Um, it, it's come down, but it was a. Um, uh, it wasn't flash, but it was. Uh, cl you click on on because I took a photograph of the object in their home. So you clicked on the the image of the object. It took you to the interview, and then if they were in French, actually I, I did translations both ways. So you could you could click on and get a, a transcription of the interview in French or in English. Um, it would pop up on the screen. Um, and also, the, when you opened the website, um, it, you, you saw an image of, of the two cities side by side, uh, a quick time. Yeah. Um, and the, the two cities actually, you know, have a lot in common <laughs> in many ways, in both port cities and uh, Marseille being um, kind of a, thought of as kind of crime-ridden part a city in France, and, and Baltimore has the same uh, reputation, so that yeah. was part of the... Yeah. And did you get a lot of response as well from the internet? Do you think that's how most people experience the work? Or um, I think, yeah, I think most people did. I did also do um, a, an installation in Baltimore in, 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 at a gallery. I, I also showed the website in some exhibitions. Great. So pro probably more people saw it by the website mm. than the uh, installation. Great, thank you. Does anyone mm -hmm. have any questions, Helen, about that? Did, were you, did you know that work? I'm also interested in how much you knew about this, uh, how, as mm. artists of Future of the mm. Present, how much you knew about the other works that were being made. Um, I knew Lynn and her work, but not that piece. Yeah. yeah some works also the same. Yeah. Some works you just sent. Yeah. yeah. Was sure. Thank you. Great. So, um, so it's the time for the uh, cosmonaut. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Irina Danilova, and I'm trying to make this bigger now, but let's see. I wonder whether actually I put the film on at the same time, yeah, so that we'll have it, and then yeah. we can see it. Here we go. Yes.
And this took li live, place live at Pseudo Studios as well in, yes. in 1999. It could be totally live, uh, except for the last point, the last moment that was, you know, added to the recording. So we did live piece, though, different, whereas the yeah. phone was used. So this last piece, beat was uh, supposed to be added to the uh, recording, that's why it was pre-recorded. But uh, I have to say first, uh, from uh, first of all, it was in collaboration with Steve Ashbury, um, this piece. And uh, um, from the point of, um, from my point of performer, uh, when we turned into digital, it was uh, quite um, different, um, only one, one kind of like, um, part because uh, virtual was only one thing it was an audience because everything else was the same you know like we were it was a place where we were performing and stuff so everybody else was uh, real so basically mm -hmm. we kind of like exchanged a possibility to show it to mass uh, you know much more people in the audience uh, we kind of exchanged our distance from from it and this I, I, I agree with uh, Marta because uh, being in a space, it was kind of like natural because, uh, you know, virtual I reality is uh, <laughs> quite distant from the audience itself. It, uh, not only in technical uh, way, as you mentioned, but also in this. Um, so apparently this piece was about limitations, uh, limitations of uh, working in space, uh, limitation of um, collaboration between two different uh, cultures. So both of us were, I mean, looking from now, I understand that we both were shocked, culturally shocked <laughs> when we were working together. I was still new to American culture. I was not yet American back then and just re recently uh, came to America. Mm, it was my first collaboration with American. Uh, it's also uh, of course, about, uh, you know, you could see that I was uh, trying to be uh, not only Russian-American cosmo cosmonaut, astronaut, but also women and, and uh, men. And, uh, you know, I think uh, cosmonauts and astronauts uh, have lack of expression of that <laughs> in their costumes. So I was trying to do uh, mine. My pubical uh, piece was constantly kind of like falling <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and uh, that was part of this performance as well, too. And what I have to also say, uh, you know, about um, this piece, about future and present, it was like present in the past, and we are now future of the present. And when, when you, thank you for, you know, for this piece was kind of like um, on the background for a long time, uh, relation to Franklin Furness wasn't, and it's actually unusual, unusually um, all the time with us. Um, but uh, when I look at this piece, I, I felt like it's very contemporary in a way, because this tangling of American-Russian tangling is reminds me of something uh, totally, uh, uh, you know, what's happening now. And uh, apparently with the idea of undermining our democracy and, you know, and our system, it's very explosive too, so. Um, <laughs> As you know, Mir in Russia, it's um, the word that means not only peace but also the world itself. So mm. that was what struck me that it was peace, peace that relates to our presence now, too, from that presence yeah. into the future. Yeah.
And Unfortunately, but they hope we will survive. Yeah. <laughs> It was this piece particularly, I think, the bit where they're all sort of attached and you can only one of you can write. You've got these two keyboards and you're kind of, in sh you can't <laughs> escape each other, but you can't sort of be without each other in order to just write this message. So, yeah. Yeah, As we were uh, putting our clothes up, like our, uh, you know, equipment up, we were tangled, uh, mm. tangling to with each other more and more. So yes. And the last piece came from Armageddon. It was movie yeah. of that era. Yeah, so it yeah. is kind of like recent. Great. Yeah, and you have your outfit still here, which is incredible. Yes. <laughs> 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 so now I can't ask you any more questions. <laughs> you may. <laughs> when do you wear that last? Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> when, when was the last you time can you ask wore that? Kind of uh, what, what? When was the last time that you wore that? Well, not exactly there. Yeah. Just there. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. This is 20 yeah, years no, later. It's, it's actually, yeah, it's uh, thanks to Hiram's uh, uh, possibility to, you know, providing me space for the uh, holding my stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. my installation stuff. Yeah, no, it was, it was all, all, I mean, you cannot hide it much. You cannot put it into the drawer. So each time I came to my room where, it, you know, where it's all my pieces are, uh, each time it's actually stick out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I saw it all the time. Hiram saw it all the time. So yeah. Uh, but and, uh, yeah, I didn't wear it. <laughs> and you went on a. You also went on a. Um, you also went on a walk, didn't you, around the streets, right? Because I found came across some. Yes, we were preparing for the show. We yeah. also make a slow walk. Uh, yeah. Space walk, we called it. Uh, that piece. I think in here somewhere we've got some images of you being. Here we go, out in the street. There we go. So you're walking the street with yes, your helmet on. Yes, uh, slow. Yeah, yeah, it was slow walk, and it was in most. Uh, Kind of like it was on 34th Street and yeah. around Macy's, <laughs> so it was the most busy, uh, one of the most busy, uh, many of those places. But uh, we chose some intersection which was mm. quite busy, people rushing, running, uh, you know, rushing, and we were very slow walking here, yeah, like <laughs> from the moon, yeah. <laughs> space people, people not from outer space. Mm. Um, have we got any questions from no. the no, powers that be? <laughs> I was just going to point out, I think the best thing in the video is that if you look, you can see all the New Yorkers refusing to notice right. these two <laughs> space people slowly <laughs> walking. Well, I have to say, they're one just of, yeah, they're too sophisticated. It. Well, yeah. they're New Yorkers, you know, <laughs> anything could mm. happen. Well, one of the really interesting things, side things that I've found in my research has been. Um, in looking through videos particularly that took place in the street. So Scott was one group from Belgrade who did a project where they tried to give out coupons for survival coupons and they just, um, they were basically kind of got entangled in the Yugoslav war so that they had a bit of an escape to by coming here for a bit as far as I understand. And what's really fascinating is to see uh, these performances happening in a space when everybody, no one has their phones on them and it's just become quite a fascinating uh, the crowd mm -hmm. looks quite fascinating, mm -hmm. suddenly being um, eating their sandwiches and actually being physically properly present watching stuff. And it, it kind of, uh, of course, I remember it then, but you forget how it looks and the crowd look different. So mm -hmm. this was also, that's interesting, you made that comment because I think, yeah, you can see it here. No. No. But people are having a little bit uh, of a hard time hearing from you guys. Oh, so they're having a hard time. Oh, you closer. need to speak, come ah, forward. Okay. 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 Okay, so um, so now I think we'll t uh, go to you, Diane. Do you want to come forward then, so that people can hear a bit better? Can you hear Tony and Lynn? You can hear things. It, well, not too clearly, unless uh, people move closer to the microphone. Uh, we can barely hear them. Oh no. Okay. No. Okay. So we'll find you yours. So, um, okay, so this is Diane Luden who um, received two grants in the future of the present um, series. series. One was 2000, 
-hmm. And I'm so glad that you sent me this website because I'm <laughs> like going so many. I've got a whole slideshow of dead links that I've come across in doing yeah. my research. Most right. of them are kind of um, either sex websites or property websites. And a right. few 404s. And then you sent me this. So here it was. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm just going to kind of um, go through this and you can sort of speak. But it was just, I was just delighted to find this because this really reminded me um, of just how. Oh, this one doesn't actually go anywhere, does it, that one? <laughs> no, it's a loop. Oh, it does go, okay. Because um, what we did was um, we configured a computer that could do ASCII cam streaming. Mm. So that was one of the mediums we did. Um, and um, when I was working in, in 2000, I was surrounded by a lot of women who were also working in technology. And there was all this uh, promotion of the fact that it, it was like a boys game, which I never experienced mm. in quite the same way. Mm. I think, I, I mean, I was always surrounded by women who were working in technology, so that was my project was to bring together a couple of other women and for us to do some live video sets and a website. And so we configured a computer to, yeah. to do the ASCII cam st streaming. And if you go to the ID banner app. Yeah. There's um, black and white. So go to the, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, so that was my friends in Rome. Um, I worked with two other women. One, one's uh, Francesca de Rimini, who's part of uh, another girl group called VNS Matrix, which is really important for lots of reasons, I think. And um, and I was working with uh, Agnese Trocchi, who was part of a group of people in Rome who were also doing uh, squad social, social, social center work. And um, yeah, so we were all working a lot with writing and internet media and video. And so we all came together and just came up with some pseudonyms that we yeah. then um, Which you see here. animated. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Just move this side. yeah. So, should I use this one? Yeah, that's, um, let's go to Spirit of Data. Yeah. And that's one of the perform, that's one of the, some of the documentation. Yeah, okay. Of a show yeah. we were part of. <laughs> and it was the website work that we had done, so keep going. Yeah. And you'll see, um, uh, I guess it's not possible yeah, yeah. to turn it. I mean, what I really liked about <laughs> going through this website was, um, was just kind of how freely, how it just wasn't a template and how it just made me realize how everything that we do now is kind of templated and we're mm -hmm. so used to it. And you could, when you just go around and you have different fonts and it looks different and it reminded me of, you know, building also websites um, and you've got this music and things like that. And, and that was authored by a friend of ours in Italy. So yeah. Francesca de Rimini in Australia was working with somebody in Italy to create a soundtrack for Liquid Nation, which was so, her character. So it was a really collaborative project that you did, kind of with a lot of different people in different mm -hmm. places, and yeah, yeah. And it's just yeah, and you've got these poems, and then these amazing images, and it's it's such a kind of simple way that it's put together. But there's something really exciting about kind of exploring that, and I think, you know, now pretty much every website we build will be with a, some kind of template, which almost feels like it's a ready-made really, and you can mm -hmm. only just put your mm -hmm. signature on the on the side mm -hmm. of the urinal, and that's all you can do, and. You know, in those days, you'd kind of build everything totally from scratch, and I mean, you can, could, of course, still do that. But then right. We, we, yeah. What you're looking at here is Francesca de Rimini. Right. Um, and she was Liquid Nation, mm. and she, to me, is uh, the mistress of hypertext. Yeah. Because she had been making lots of hypertextual works under different identities. Yeah. And she had been working on the net with other girl groups and other um, people internationally. Yeah. So that's we took from her practice. And are you still in touch with yes. uh, these she people? Yes, she actually yeah. came to New York, and I saw her just this last year. That's great. She was here for a show with, with uh, Virginia Barrett, who's yeah. another VNS Matrix yeah. person. But also that you don't really hold on to your authorship here like as individuals. It's a kind no. of colla you'll just collapse into one body that is this website on the, on the internet, which is mm -hmm. also interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, Tony, I don't know if you want to um, say anything more since we kind of lost you for half of 
half of your what you were saying before. Well, that's okay. I mean, most of what I was speaking about was very different, of course, from what the artists have been saying in the sense that I was almost, in some ways, uh, adding footnotes to, to the history that Martha was giving to how we arrived to the future of the present, mm. if you will, and then the, uh, the subsequent years. Um, you know, I mean, uh, to me, uh, even listening to the artists speak about their works now, 20 years on, uh, it, 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 uh, it shows me that, that this work is still relevant and fresh today in the sense that it, it hasn't dated conceptually even mm. though uh, even though the aesthetics may seem dated you know in the sense that uh, some of the, the observations you were making about the way the web looked back then say or things on the internet may have looked you know with these small uh, video clips but but uh, some of these concepts are, are still relevant and still valid and although we now have, if you will, uh, better technology or, or the technology is more prevalent in, in that, you know, here we are this evening organizing this event uh, without needing to go uh, to a media studio of any sort, but still, you know, the rawness of it uh, shows you how, how uh, we're not there yet, really. So as much as we're now in the future of that past, uh, there's still there's still more to come, so I'm wondering uh, what an iteration of any of the works, not just of the artists who are present, would be. You know, but any of the other artists, would, uh, and there were there were uh, several dozen artists uh, on 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 these on these programs. You know, what it would be now if this work were to be presented now? Yeah, say. I've been thinking about that a lot. It's interesting. Yeah. I mean, and, and if we if we think of Ray's work as an example, you know, uh, which I which I wrote about even in the book in, in these terms, this is what has really happened uh, most broadly. You know, where where everyone became a thief, if you will, or or a lot of people, if, if not everyone, became a thief online. You know, with with all the downloading and reusing of material that is uh, someone else's intellectual property. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's it's almost it's almost accepted that we're all thieves if not art thieves now mm. yeah, to some degree yeah now i've been thinking about this so i was surprised how much work there was about surveillance actually even in very very early on as well and works that i hadn't known about before that i feel like they need to be shown so that's been an interesting journey for me as well for sure and i think it's and it is also the looking at the you know, now today is is yesterday's future, isn't it? So, you know, now we're in it, and then we're, what's our future, and how we and this sort of constant. I think with technology, you're constantly on the brink of. Um, you know that what is now is not what's going to be there tomorrow, and so it's this almost perhaps this, I don't know, maybe restlessness or something where we can't quite just be in a moment, and it's sort of always going on in the archive and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. Has anyone got any other? Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. it was interesting. Like to come forward. <laughs> I was just thinking that it's interesting that the future of the present ended in two thousand and eight mm. with yeah. the big banking crisis. It's kind of oh, that was actually <laughs> something I really want. Thank you for reminding me. That's something I really wanted to talk about because um, yeah, <coughs> I hadn't made the connection with the banking mm. crisis, but I found it very interesting that um, it was then because Martha. I spoke to Martha about it. Martha said that. Basically, at the beginning, and actually I observed this as well, in the early days, in the sort of up, up until probably 2002, you had the two funds. You have the Future of the Present Fund, which was um, all this lot, and 70-odd artists over the whole year, whole ten decade that got it. And then there was the Fund for Performance. And at the beginning, it felt like the people who were doing the Fund for Performance were kind of performing despite the uh, presence of the internet. Like, we are, I'm a body, I'm in a space, and kind of almost in the kind of quite 70s trajectory, that which of course was uh, was Franklin Furness's roots anyway. Uh, and then of course, I'd already kind of thought, well, two th around 2008, when was, because I'm looking at the merge of where is the person, where, well, going back to the digital, two digital bodies really, the physical body and the digital body, where do they merge? And I felt that really it's been, it was when people had an iPhone, had smartphones, where there was no longer so so divi such a divide, and then, mm -hmm. and you also found that the proposals that were coming in were never, d you could never just have a clean, um, offline division. or a clean online. Right. Were, yeah, the division right. just didn't exist. And then, th then the year came along when Adrian Wartzel 
got a grant for the Franklin Furnace Fund for performance art, built robots and had the robots performing. That yes. was the end of the, so we decided not to divide the grants mm -hmm. up anymore mm -hmm. and just, you know, because technology was a given at that point. Yes. And then Ben crashed as you And then. <laughs> yeah. And Lynn, would you like to um, say any more? I don't know. I mean, it's interesting to see uh, the, this uh, array of, um, of pieces and, and the time frames that it represents. I guess mine is on the later side, uh, or more recent side. Yeah. It's, you know, it doesn't have a performance aspect at all, really, except that I was, um, uh, you know, creating portraits of people live, you know, or recording recorded portraits mm. of people. So it's kind of interesting, that I think, the evolution of the of a Franklin Furnace and... Um, just, just how the, the work that w was part of it um, probably changed over the years type of work. Yeah. And the issues changed also. The, I think the issue of surveillance, for example, Julia Scher's mm. piece where she was spying, she was basically spying on other people. Uh, Pornography was the big deal during the culture wars, and then surveillance became the big deal during the digital era. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the internet so also. The yeah, the internet also was l largely a pornography-driven medium. Uh, <laughs> yeah, true. Sure. It's the military so? and, yeah. and, yeah. and porn. Yeah, yeah. porn <laughs> like video. Video is the same thing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, how increase how horribly it. ironic that is. Yeah. Right. So I don't know, does anyone want to, how are we doing? Have, you, has anyone, we've got a few guests here. Yeah. <laughs> have you got any questions or comments? Or, or have you? <laughs> and is there anything on? So, I don't know. Yeah, Tony, have you got anything, any closing remarks? Well, this, this, this interesting connection between pornography and surveillance, I mean, we could even flip it on its head. And uh, to some degree, uh, you know, in internet studies now, we're looking at uh, surveillance through pornography, uh, where I don't know if any of you have received any of these uh, scam emails that have been going around this summer, you know, where you get someone claiming they have a video of you pleasuring yourself to pornography uh, you see, mm -hmm. uh, that they've captured you through your webcam and could you please send some money to this uh, Bitcoin account so that this video can be deleted that was in um, <laughs> Black Mirror there was an episode about that wasn't there yes indeed yeah so you know it, it's 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 almost as if it, in the same way that Franklin Furnace has spent more than 40 years trying to see how things come together. It's as if, you know, pornography and surveillance have come together <laughs> in the through, through yeah. the culture. Yeah. So, I mean, if I may close with something, though, that uh, Martha wrote uh, back when Franklin Furnace went virtual. Martha wrote, uh, the internet is a wide open frontier with very few fences in place. This is 1997 when she wrote. This is the time for artists to get uh, uh, their underground ideas to the broadest possible audience through the convergent art medium the 20th century spent itself looking for. And this was this was in a prominent place on the very first uh, iteration of the Franklin Furness uh, website. And, uh, uh, and, and to me, uh, you know, this really embodies and explains um, how and why Franklin Furness became involved in all this. You know, to, to, to me, it's clear when we, when we hear Martha writing something like this or saying something like this, that there's a continuum. You know, there, there, there's, there's no, you know, here's something new, let's try this. No, really, it's, it's, it's a continuum of, of finding the best way to share these artists' ideas. So also, you know, this, this split between the program for technology and the program for performance, what have you, it, it, it's similar to what was going on in the gallery and what mm, was going yeah. on in the performance space. You know, and yeah. you artists who would go from one space to the other very, very seamlessly. So, so you know, you you would have, I don't know, uh, um, Karen Finley in the performance space and then uh, an installation, an exhibition with Karen Finley in the gallery space. It didn't really make any difference. It's just, it's just the right and appropriate space for that particular piece. 
Huh? That's quite shiny. Yeah. Um, Franklin Furnace went virtual in 96. But at what time did it uh, become Franklin Furnace Archives? In Same that time? That was day one. No, Franklin Furnace Archive was the, the incorporated name. From the very beginning? Yes. Oh, okay, I get it. So you didn't change the mission no. to be more archival? No, no. Okay. So I have also some questions from the questionnaire that were from, um, some are from you, but others are from artists who aren't here. Uh, this was from Alex Killo, who says, how relevant is art and technology in a time when almost all tech has been mainstream or owned, controlled by third parties and disrespectful of privacy and personal liberty? Is there any rea reality to free or liberal, um, to any reality in a world where artist practice is ho wholly commodified? So is there any kind of escape? Can we rightfully embrace art and technology in the face of environmental collapse? Which is a whole, that's a huge a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Several questions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to figure that out. Can you come yeah. forward? Come forward. Sorry. Yeah. So my question. Can you come forward? <laughs> right forward. Yeah, you have to come forward. forward. Do you want a chair? Yeah. This, is, this is John. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so my question, it was funny when Tony, when uh, the, the live stream went off and mm. I think Tony asked, is it being recorded? And Tony said, oh, well, good, it won't be lost. Yeah. And I thought that, that I mean, I, I appreciate in the space that we are, we're, we're talking about this archive and everything living offline. I find um, when I'm doing an event, people always ask, well, are you recording it? Are you live streaming it? And I've actually taken a stand to, uh, to be in the present, you know, mm -hmm. and to really think about not recording anything, having everyone have to exist today, right mm -hmm. now, at this moment. And I just wanted to ask some of you that have worked this way, and I think, and you hinted at it, like everything now is a template, you know, mm, nothing yeah. is original anymore. And then this is to this question mm. of uh, third party, everything, everything we do is commodified and every, mm. every being, every click, every friend. So I wonder uh, maybe what the conversation might be to going back to this moment together ourselves. What if we were in this room having this conversation that maybe was recorded, maybe wasn't. And then how does that disseminate yeah. in today's world? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah, that's Thanks. very nice. Um, I used to have a... I used to have an ongoing um, argument with um, a friend of mine, and he was a performance artist, and he used to insist that the real-time moment was it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he wasn't engaged in mm. documentation. Yeah. I mean, there is that whole debate, and Tony, we talked about that as well, Peggy Phelan, who's like, yes. you know, you can't, as soon as you document it, it's not documentation anymore. So, but now, of course, uh, it's like people do, they almost, I mean, they almost live, you go to parties sometimes where uh, the, the phones are more prevalent than the people and the fun that's being had just seems to be entirely directed at phones. I've <laughs> had that experience a couple of times since being here and, um, mm. and in, I mean, all cities really. But yeah, so that's where I'm kind of looking at the, you know, the body is performing for the, for the, to, to make the digital body look better. And even with this Zoom thing where your skin looks so nice, you know, so, you know, my digital body looks better than the physical one. So I might as well have a meeting online because I'm going to look better rather than, you know, and also dragging my body from, you know, here to there to sit and actually talk to someone. But I agree that when you actually talk, there is still a, an effect and not everything. I don't think that archiving and recording everything means um, that that doesn't equal impact. I think that, and, and I think there's a kind of movement also in I've met quite a few young people lately who just don't have a phone or are resisting it, and I think mm -hmm. that's also very interesting. Mm. And of course, you or know, Facebook. or Facebook as well. I mean, that's I mean, it was interesting on this platform media, yeah. the way everybody here is on Facebook, and then I tried to put it on Instagram, but you know, that's not the case there, so it's also a generational thing. But it will be easier to archive when there is no recording at all, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. right? <laughs> no, but it's also about the no and then no file. cheese, yeah. <laughs> But it's also the vulnerability Real as life. well of the archive, of the digital archive. So, for instance, when I was here in the 90s, um, I wrote, you know, I set up my first Hotmail account actually in the old Franklin Furnace offices. And another intern helped me set up my first Hotmail account in 1998. And, you know, in those days I actually wrote sort of long emails back home to friends or whatever. And I was thinking they would have been really useful now for this research that I'm doing because they were first-hand, you know, first-hand statements and reflection on what was happening but they've all I don't log into Facebook um, uh, Hotmail very much but they've all gone so mm -hmm. since I think the oldest emails I have now are 2005 so that's six years seven years of correspondence that's just just gone without me even knowing and I didn't think I'd miss my Hotmail <laughs> emails mm -hmm. until they weren't there and, th and then I'm it, it, and I don't know how to get them back and I don't know if I will and th if you think that's happened to everybody as well so uh, so it's sort of, you know, the case for and against archiving. Uh, and there is also artwork that only documentation. So mm. 
you know, it's kind of exactly. like how you can divide those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think also this 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 comment that Alex Killo makes about art and technology in the face of environmental collapse. I mean, that's a huge thing, and the idea that you know just being online um, is is a greener way of being is not because you know it's not it's not virtual. It's not without huge amount of um, so that's something that I think Energy, we all yes. exactly. Um, we had also a question from Andrea Polly. How are ideas about the near future presented through performance art and how are these manifested over time? I think we might have co covered that. About the near future? Ad yeah, ideas about the near future presented through performance. And I think mm. that we saw that in these, in these performances, particularly, I think, with yours and also perhaps with yours and the way that it's worked. Yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah, we'll through them. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then also we had a comment from Mouchette who answered, or the person behind Mouchette, saying you should ask about the preservation of internet works that were made 15 years ago and how they've been preserved. And that's where, again, this uh, sore point of year 2000, where there was a collaboration that year with Parsons, so the artists got to work with students, which was kind of an exciting thing. Um, but they're all archived now on a, on a, on a server that doesn't exist. We think we can chase it up somewhere, but it sort of goes, you have to go and email people who worked 20 years ago at that place. But I yeah. went on the Wayback Machine. Yeah. Wayback, yes, exactly. You can find some stuff there. Yeah. Do you mind if I say something? Yes, of course, yeah. Um, um, I, was, I think that I, I, I was thinking when I, with my project, I, the, the word technology, um, it was one of the impetus was just thinking about that word that people used it even at that time in 2003 to talk about new technology but something like a book or a vacuum cleaner, you mm. don't think of as technology, but actually, you know, it's, <laughs> it's been with humans all along. It's just that it's different technology, new technology. Uh, but I think that the whole issue of, um, of archiving is, yes, it's a very huge issue in obsolescence. Mm. Um, the, 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 my black and white camera, I can still take pictures and still see them, but the, the hard drives I had and yeah. 2003, I can't access that data anymore, mm. you know, unless you keep yeah. transferring it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I got excited about these slides. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I would say that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say something. I would yeah. say that there's a push to um, come, come, come. There's a push to chase after the latest technology, and that overrides a lot of social kind of issues, mm. always. Yeah, and. I think there's companies invested in us chasing after the latest, mm -hmm. greatest. Also, yeah, yeah that's very important. Inventing the new technologies for us to chase. Yeah. It yeah. also overrides artistic issues because yeah. it can take time to master a particular technology. Mm -hmm. I, te I spend forever on a given level of technology. I'm extreme, mm -hmm. but I think, I think a lot of artists will rush to the next thing when they haven't fully absorbed what's out there. Right. People have different relationships. Yeah, and I see that in the technology industry overall, like making a living yeah. in the technology industry. There's a, a big shift from the, I met this woman the other day who's working on mainframes, and that's mm -hmm. something that she was doing in the 80s and the 90s, and now she's doing where I'm working. Mm -hmm. uh, but she said that there's no more work for that anymore, because yeah. it's an outdated technology. Yeah. But, I mean, mm -hmm. what did people do mm -hmm. when... What do people do? Is that the note we're going to end on? <laughs> what do we do? No, I think I think people can do much. Yeah. There's much for us to do. Mm. I agree. Yeah. And, and it's always going to be a battle between large corporations and large corporate interests and individuals. Yeah. I mean, t uh, yeah. As um, oh, as I think it was one. Of, yeah, I think it was Alex said. Well, Tony, maybe you said it's the same. It was. It, I mean, it wasn't without big corporations back then either. It was AOL and. Time Warner and things, so it wasn't as if that was completely. Well, sort of PhD, wasn't that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like pure things, exactly. So, um, yeah. So yeah, we're no. always, always battling with the. But big there companies. was a time before AOL when the internet was only non-commercial. Mm. It seems incredible. It seems like a dream, but that mm. was the case. Mm. It was government run. Yeah, government and educational institutions and right. commerce was. I think it wasn't allowed. And now it just seems preposterous to say that now. Right. Well, so and there was a time before the World Wide Web when the internet was doing a lot of things that were not the web. Right. I'm going to just show some dead links that I've come across in, in this um, before we end. 
So here are some here are some of my dead links I found that were meant to be artist websites. Can you share your screen? Oh, sorry. Oh, you mean those are just 404? Uh... This was like, yeah. Um, oh. Share screen. Yeah, this was, um, so this was sort of where I, you know, was very excited to find websites and then um, kind of was found these. <laughs> so this is a series. So this was fine, except you have to download Flash or download something. Lots of 404s, um, uh, property websites. <laughs> Please come back later. <laughs> Top reasons why you should trust the UK online casinos. So yeah, it's just also this sort of, um, you know, who takes over these spaces when they're not, and, and of course also the cost of real space on online as well, so yeah. So a lot okay. of stuff to work with. That's yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Great, uh, I'll find, where are you, I'll find you here. So yeah, I think um, probably that's a good place. We can raise a glass of and wine. We can raise a glass <laughs> of wine. And I think also this is, um, thank you all so much for, you know, responding to my randomly sent out questionnaire and for answering it and for being here physically and also not physically. Like, thank you so much, Tony, for all your help. And, um, and Lynn, really great to have you involved as well. And I feel like, obviously, I'm sort of, um, I mean, I've just been here three weeks and I think it's for the first time I've also really done archive research and, and coming here and kind of with a certain idea. So originally I was going to focus on it on the first two years and then I realised that actually in order to get anything particularly um, kind of interesting beyond just very ex sort of semi-examples, I needed to look at the whole decade and that's when it then became really interesting in terms of that as a body of work in itself. Um, as the grant, the, the grants that are awarded. So I feel like this is the beginning, perhaps, of a longer conversation that I might try to have with um, with you guys and with other um, artists as well, and of course with Franklin Furness. So um, yeah, I really appreciate also all the help that I've had Franklin Furness from Martha Harley and also Alice Wu, who was wanted to be here but couldn't unfortunately at the last minute, and she was the administrator for several years yeah. here. Yes. And when I was here interning, um, and also for Andrea, who's been very helpful, and, and also Marcus. Marcus Chang, who's next door, and then I also had Ruth, and all, all their names are on the Facebook thing, but um, pretty much every single intern is somehow <laughs> <laughs> embroiled with my work at some point, doing something or other. Um, and yeah, it's very, uh, it's very great to be back here and to kind of come across these um, archived memories alongside my own hazy ones, and to kind of yeah, see all of us and uh, where we are now, so thank you. And thanks for whoever is watching, and um, this will be also archived somewhere. <laughs> we, might take it off, we might take it off Facebook and put it on Vimeo, but we'll let you know where it is. <laughs> thank you very much. So, yeah. thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna stop the um, Facebook thing. It's still going, it's still going. <laughs> this is going, it's still good. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> bye, Tony. Thank you so much. Bye, Tony. Yeah, good. You got your wine. We need <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Yeah, it's evening where he is. Yeah, it's it is. Seven hours. Right, now I need to stop the stream. Where is he? In? He's in England. 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 What? Hull? I think he said Hull. Oh, okay. Ending my video. Thank you. Yeah. We're digging it out. So great of you to show up as a cosmonaut. <laughs>